And a very pleasant good day to each and every one of you. I'm Brother James. I greet you one more time in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. We are studying together the Bible book of Revelation. And we have come to verse 11, moving very slowly, but we'll, we'll press through the 11th verse and jump on into verse number 12 uh, at this time. Let's read it. Uh, Jesus Christ speaking, and he says in verse 11, I am Alpha and Omega. We covered that in verse number eight, beautiful truth, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book. That's what you have. And send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. From where John was located on Patmos, if he looked eastward, the location of the seven churches would be in a rough semi-circle, and they are named in clockwise order, which would be the order in which they would be readily accessible by the roads of that day. So if John could leave the island and someone, someone is going to leave the island with this book that John is writing, they would take that book, they would travel from Patmos to uh, Asia, and then they would travel in, in a clockwise fashion starting at Ephesus and ending up in Laodicea. Pretty simple. And I turned to see the voice. Pretty interesting. That voice is a person. It's, it's Jesus Christ. He's Alpha. He's Omega. He's the first. He's the last. He's the voice. To see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Come down to verse number 20. Uh, the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest <coughs> are the seven churches. Revelation is not mysterious unless someone makes it that way. Revelation is not uh, confusing unless someone makes it that way. People make Revelation difficult when they try to make it say something other than what it says. People make Revelation difficult when they try to interpret it rather than teach it. And here's a great example. We could do all kinds of wild and crazy speculation about candlesticks, but we don't have to. It, it's, it's pretty clear. Verse 12, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Verse 20, the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. He is using candlestick to illustrate church, and we can understand church by looking at candlestick. It's, it's not hard. It becomes hard when men try to say, well, a candlestick, the mystic, uh, peculiar meaning of candlestick, which is available only to those of us who are illumined, see, then it gets all weird. But church, candlestick, candlestick church, and all of that, we have the great advantage of having uh, many, many cross-references to work from. Now, the commentators, and I've, I've read scores of them, no exaggeration, scores of them, uh, they're almost unanimous in changing this statement to suit their purposes. This is not a seven-pronged candlestick. So eager are men to link the New Testament church with Old Testament Israel, you're, gonna, you're not going to get tired of hearing me say it. You're going to benefit from hearing me say it over and over again that they, they alter the words to form new cross-references which aren't in the Bible. Yes, there was a seven-pronged candlestick found in the tabernacle in the wilderness, 
But what we have here is something quite different. This is not seven branches on one candlestick. These are seven separate candlesticks. If you make it a seven-pronged candlestick, you hide the truth that while Christ is the head of the church and there is but one, the church is manifest on earth in separate local congregations, which are not branches or prongs from a main trunk. Come on, now stay with me. Verse 11, what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches. Okay? The seven churches. And yet, and yet, the Bible says, says, I speak concerning Christ and the church in 1 Corinthians and Ephesians 5. And 1 Corinthians 12 says that everyone who's been baptized into Christ is part of one body. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter number 5 that everyone who has been espoused to Christ is part of the bride of Christ. So, so 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 5, in, in the book of Acts, uh, they, were, they were all added to the church. So well, don't you think that's one local assembly meeting in one place? Um, you tell me where 3,120 saved people sat under one roof and were taught by one pastor in Jerusalem. What church building would that be? Okay, anyway. Here's what you have. If you try to make this a seven-branched, seven, I can't do it, a seven-branched candlestick, you've, see, you've seen them, like the ones in the tabernacle, like the one in the tabernacle. What you are opening the door to teach is Christ, represented on earth by a pope, and all of these churches joined in one, earthly, visible, physical, or denominational headquarters, and here's all the colleges, and here's all the schools, and here's all the churches, and that's a very, very dangerous thing. Not only is it not scriptural, it, it's quite problematic, as you would know if you've read church history. The tabernacle had one candlestick with seven lamps, Exodus 25, 31 to 37. But here we have seven separate candlesticks, and the reason is that during the old economy, there was a visible unity represented in many, many different ways, the Jewish nation. The churches of this dispensation have a spiritual unity in the person of Christ, but their visible unity is only manifest in local churches, and there is obviously no visible unity beyond those local gatherings. In fact, there's not much visible unity in most local assemblies of believers. While none but the most extreme would deny that there is but one true church of which Jesus Christ is the Savior and the head and the chief cornerstone, this church exists on earth in diverse localities and in countless local congregations. I used to work with a man who believed that his church, the Church of Christ, was the one and only true church, true body of Christ. And and it was interesting because this man was, by birth, a, a black man. He wasn't an African-American. He'd never been to Africa, but, but he was a black man. And he would, he would, whenever I would start to witness to someone, he would, he would sh uh, very loudly say, the Church of Christ is the one true church. The Church of Christ is the body of Christ. And yet, and I, and I would ask him each time he would say this, two miles from the church he attended was another church of Christ where the people who were born white attended. Although none of them was white, they were all various shades of, of, of cream or, or pale or so. You, you understand. 
Well, anything you say anything about race, people get all nervous, don't they? Anyway, this man was a black man who attended a church of Christ and believed that his church was the one true church. And two miles away were people who attended a church of Christ who believed they were the one true church, but they wouldn't fellowship together because of their skin color. How would either of those be representative of Jesus Christ? And, and then I, I've, I've worked with other men who believe that their, their missionary Baptist church was the one true and only apostolic holy church. And of course, the Roman Catholic Church, their official position is that everyone outside the baptized congregation of the Roman Catholic Church is damned to hell. They won't say that in America for political purposes, but that's the official doctrine of their church upheld by all their popes and cardinals and, and the rest of it. So anyway, we don't buy that. We believe that everyone who has trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior has been placed in Christ and that those in Christ make up his body and the Bible calls his body the church. That's what we believe. But the scriptures nowhere contemplate the visible church as one made up of all believers in a country, like the Church of England or the uh, Church of Scotland or something like that, nor do the scriptures ever, ever suggest that a particular denomination a, a, a collection or, or cooperative of churches is the one true church. The churches addressed in each epistle are individual congregations. They have their own ministers, their own elders, their own deacons, their own authority, without any regard to a corporate body or a governing body other than the scriptures Jesus Christ, and themselves. There were many churches in Asia at the time of the Revelation, but seven were selected to receive letters from the Lord by way of John. These were not addressed to the church of Asia. Did you see that? But to the separate churches, local gatherings. Denominationalism with or without designating names, I was saved in a denomination that its denominational identity was that it didn't have a name to identify it as a denomination. Others uh, make much of their denominational name. Anyway, denominationalism, state churches, even fellowships where control of the local body lies outside the God-ordained structure are unscriptural. I didn't say they were unchristian or unsaved. A lot of saved people aren't, aren't in a biblical church and uh, some Christians. Well, no, I can't say that. If you're a Christian, you'd be in church because he told you to be in church. So there, there are some saved people who go to churches that aren't correct in their doctrine and there are some saved people who don't go to church at all, but that's, that's a sidetrack we can't take today. Now, now look, these seven candlesticks. The Bible says, I, I saw seven golden candlesticks and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. And then in verse 20, again, the mystery of the seven stars, and he, he goes on down the seven stars, the angels, the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So, here is Jesus Christ, and he is in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And the seven golden candlesticks are said to be the seven churches that he is addressing with or in this book of Revelation. Come with me to Matthew chapter number five. Matthew chapter five and verse number 14. Matthew 5, 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, 
but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Okay, so here's what he said. So, let, let your light, so, let your light shine like this light. If I, if I light a candle, and then, I, and then I place over the top of that candle a bushel. If I, put a, if I put a basket over the top of the candle, what am I doing? I am, I am obscuring the light of the candle. We would suggest or could suggest that that bushel represents commerce. And many, many a person has a light that was lit by the Lord Jesus Christ. But that light is not shining because career, job, love of money, being wrapped up in material things is obscuring that light. The light is there, the light is shining, but it's not shining forth because that bushel is surrounding it. Now, look in Luke chapter number Eight, Luke chapter number 8, similar teaching, but uh, with a little different t twist. Luke chapter 8, verse 16. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed. I always thought that was funny. You, you, you put a lit open flame under your bed, you're liable to cook. Not a good idea. Don't, don't, don't set a uh, lit fire under the bed there. Anyway, uh, when he hath lighted a candle, cover it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in might see the light. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be uh, known and come abroad. So this time we have the light. It's it's lit. If, G, if we're the light, Jesus must be the lighter. It's, it's lit, but it's hidden under a bed this time. And so the light can't shine. The light can't, can't reach out and, and, and affect others because it's covered by, what should we say, that which represents sloth, carelessness, idleness, taking our ease when we should be at labor. So here's a light, and it's to shine. It's to so shine. That is, to shine in this way. Shine without a bushel basket obscuring it. Shine without a bed of comfort obscuring it. But that word so is very important. And so, some of you, some of you, I've got to warn you right now, I've got to warn you, I'm about to hurt your feelings. But your feelings aren't important anyway, are they? <laughs> the Bible's important. Some of you, I, 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 I don't want to offend you. I'm not trying to offend you. But I want to show you something from the Bible. and Because that's what, that's what I want to go by. I want to go by the Bible. I hope you want to go by the Bible. So, so let's look at this, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, we're going to look at it again. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. Where do they put it? But on a candlestick. And when that light is put on a candlestick, it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men. So where should your light be shining on a candlestick? Luke chapter 8, let's read it again. No man with he lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in might see the light. Okay. You're the light of the world. You were sometimes darkness, now you're light. 
Do you want your light to shine in the way that God intended for it to shine? Where did he put the light? Matthew 5. Where did he put the light? Luke chapter 8. He put it on a candlestick. What is the candlestick? According to Revelation chapter 1, verse 12, or verse 13, and verse number 20, it is an assembly of Christians in a local church. That's what he said. You know, you know, and I know that there are many, many towns, and I, I am speaking to people right now that that your situation is dreadful. You have been to the town, the church near your house, the church two miles away from your house, the church five miles from your house. You have you have been to pretty much every reasonable church in your town. And you say, there's just, there's just not a good church where I live. I, can I ask you something? I mean, I, I, just, just you and me, no, 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 no critical intent at all, just you and me. If there was no good job in your town, would you sit home and go broke? Or would you drive farther? When... when when we try to get home, or, or, or when, I, when I try to get to church, I, I, I live 16 miles out in the woods, 16 miles from where our, our church is located. If I, if I get up 6.30, or, or leave, leave, leave home 6.30, 7 o'clock, I can get here in about 25, 30 minutes. If I leave the 8 o'clock hour to the 9 o'clock hour, this is a small town, 25,000 people, but it's county seat town. I, I can sometimes double the travel time because people are driving in from, from other towns and other counties because they have a, a county job, sheriff's department, courthouse, uh, tax office, whatever. And they, they, they sit in their car, and they fight traffic, and they buy gasoline five and six days a week to get to where there's a job that pays better than the job right next to their house. They would do that for mammon, and they do. We have had people, I, I've had friends and family members and acquaintances, and, and so have you, who have had an offer to make much better money in another town very far away than what they could make where they, where they were living. Now, they had a comfortable living, they had an adequate living, but they thought about it, I could live so much better if I relocated to that town where that job opportunity is, and they just packed up everything and went to that town for mammon. If Jesus Christ said, and he did, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I, there am I, where? In the midst, in the midst. What did he say about the seven candlesticks? He was in the midst of the seven candlesticks. What were those candlesticks? They were seven local churches. Here's what I would say to you. If you live in our town, you should be in our church. Your light is to shine. Do you know what the Lord said in Matthew and in Luke about that light shining? He said it gave light to all that were in the house. That's interesting. That light of that candlestick was not intended to light the world. Jesus is the light of the world. It said in Luke that all that come in would see that light. That's a, that's a particular place. So I would say to you, if you 
live in a town and there is an adequate church there, a decent church there, the Lord wants you to be in that church. You say, well, I, I don't learn all that much when I go to church. Well, um, how much did Jesus learn when he went to the synagogue? And you understand, we live in a day and age when you can obtain books and read and learn, and you can watch video and listen to recorded sermons, and you can hear and learn and watch and learn. These are great supplements to church fellowship, but they are not to be substitutes for church fellowship. If you live a thousand miles away, I'm, I'm not your pastor. If you stay at home and we go to church, you're not going to church with us. You're watching us go to church. I, I'm not being critical. People call me all the time and they say, they say, Brother James, here's the situation. In our town, there's not one pastor that believes the Bible. I don't doubt that. In our town, there's not one church that hasn't brought in the world's music. In our town, I, I, I believe that and I sympathize with you. But if you called me and said, the reason I don't work and provide for my family is in our town there's not one decent job, I would say to you, then you need to get someplace and find a decent job or work a crummy job longer hours. That's, that's all I know to tell you. The Bible says we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, and I'm glad you're watching, but we're not assembled together. You're there and I'm here. I'm here and you're there. So please don't 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 think I'm I'm uh, attacking the many many people that are in really really bad situations. The darkness in in our land is terrible. You think it's bad in the, in the USA? You ought to travel the world and see what what is available to Christians and believers in those places. That's one reason we're doing this because there are so many places around the world where it's just famine in the land. But many of you, and you know this, many of you, you just don't want to get along with anybody. And you just don't want to sit under anyone's preaching. And you're not shining your light outside the assembly. And you're not shining your light if you're, if you're in disobedience to Jesus Christ. In Luke 11... Verse 33, here it is again. No man, when he's lighted a candle, put it in a, in a secret place. <laughs> that's, that's you in your basement. That's, that's some of you hiding out from the government. Why are you hiding? Paul didn't hide. Peter didn't hide. James didn't hide. Jesus didn't hide. Neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick. Now, here it is again. That they which come in may see the light. So here's what we're going to say, and, and, and then we'll, we'll leave this topic and, and move on. If I go out tonight in my yard in the woods and I'm looking for whatever it is that my wife heard, and I take with me a candle, it's not going to do much. If I take a flashlight, that flashlight will say on the side, so many hundred candle power. The idea is that we put all these candles together, or the, 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 the equivalent light of all these candles together, and look how much brighter it is when they're all there shining together. God wants you to shine on your job. God wants you to shine in your school. God wants you to shine in your neighborhood. But those little tiny lights flickering out there in that wind and out there in that darkness, they're, they're better than nothing, but they're not as strong and they're not as effective 
as if every saved person in every town was gathered together, singing together, praying together, praising together, serving together. What light would shine forth if all Christians were assembled together and worshiping and working together? I know, I know, it's, a, it's a, an impossible dream, you say, but it is what Jesus wanted. You know, when he wrote those letters, he didn't write them to the seven churches and the people who weren't attending. He wrote them to the seven churches. So I, I, I'm not trying to harm my the very audience I'm addressing by making these recordings. We're making these recordings because we understand the difficulty of your situation. But we're not going to be sympathetic unless you have no alternative to your situation. Saudi Arabia, North Korea, Iran, some other places, you may not have an option. This may be it. But a lot of you, a lot of you, have settled in your spiritual life for less than you would settle for in your economic life. And that's something you ought to pray about. All right, we'll move on next time. Lord bless you.